Okay now, uh, so what I'm going to be talking about is, it's just an overview of the solar system, right? And when Andy asked me to do this, it's like a nightmare because it's very, how complicated could I go into it No, And, it, and a lot of this isn't really the normal kind of talks that I do, you know. I have to say that before I even start, you know. Uh, uh, and I think the, the main reason is that we want to look at a, how, it's just a review of the planets. Uh, how, our, how the solar system is, the current view of it, to what it was in Duncan's book, Man and the Planets, when we did the original uh, Astra discussion project in the 1970s. And when I first joined Astra, uh, the first time I went to an Astra meeting was in 1978, I think, or 77. No, it was 1977. And because I was working, it was like a, almost a year before I could go back and join it when I had another job in the cash and carry and macro in Glasgow when I wasn't working at the weekends. Uh, and since then, uh, it's amazing that over that, it's scary how long ago that was. When we 1979 was uh -huh. when Duncan's book New Worlds for was all. Was it 1979? Yes. Oh, yeah. Uh, so we've seen it an awful lot. So we, we started at Mercury in 1979. All we had was the Mariner 10 images of Mercury, that was in 1973, and we knew that Mercury was a small world, uh, about the size of the moon. Uh, and this picture here shows like the, the basics of it, uh, it's got a metal core, planet's liquid iron core makes up about three-fourths of its radius. Uh, it's, quite, it's quite small, I, think, I can't read that, it's about 4,879 kilometres in diameter, so it's a similar size to our own moon. Uh, there is no atmosphere, uh, the, the temperature is about 840 Fahrenheit, it's 450 Celsius, uh, the gravity is 0 0.38 of the Earth. Uh, so if you took a, a jump, or uh, so that's like a, that little picture there is a basketball, and you could go 10 feet on the Earth, and the equivalent on Mercury would be 26 feet. One of the most recent discoveries of Mercury is that it has got the material cadmium, cadmium which you get in batteries. Apparently it's plentiful here, which might be a, a resource that uh, people might want to use in the future. So these are some images of Mercury. I think it's really too close to the sun and it's too hot, you know, and it's also too cold, it's freezing at night time. And whether people would want to go to Mercury or not, uh, the blobs in this picture, I can't remember, I think this was to do, uh, it's not, it must be to do with heat areas on the planets, this. So there's another diagram that shows it's got a core, 1,800 kilometres, and has a, a mantle, which is 600 kilometres thick, and the crust is 100 to 200 kilometres thick. And because it doesn't have an atmosphere uh, like, the, like the moon, uh, it is, it's called an impact craters. Of course, when I started in astronomy in 1970, which is about 10 years roughly before Duncan's book, all you ever saw of a Mercury was phases, like a moon knot, and we had no idea at all what it, what it looks like. Uh, in that 30 year period, if I get this right, we've only had two spacecraft. We've got the Mariner 10 in 1973, and then the Americans have had one recently that only, I think it was last year, it came to the end of its mission. And the European Space Agency is planning to send it back to Colombo in the next few years to Mercury. Has um, that been delayed then? Uh, well, I, I don't know if it's been delayed. It's been ongoing for years and years. I think it's yeah, probably, been, to be it probably, it's probably been, been delayed because of lack of funding, which happens a lot in the European space. Agency also happens in that sort of thing. It, it's all cancelled then, it's still going on. It happens in my life. Uh, so, the, uh, so, Mercury has a, is this like a magnetic field of ma magneto poise, a magnetic field and a very short wave. So, uh, it has a, a small magnetic field, I think we've discovered that. Uh, and this is uh, another since it's in a false colour image that's bringing up detail on the surface of Mercury. 
Uh, I think the, the colours here, I think, are the, 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 I think the darker areas are the, the, the lower down, I can't remember. Then moving on to Venus, uh, in the 1970s, uh, I mean, when Duncan had his book, well, Venus, the Soviets had sent uh, stuff to Venus in the 60s, uh, the Venera spacecraft, the first American planetary spacecraft, I think the Mariner 6, I don't remember, in the 60s, and Venus is not a, a nice place at all, it is completely covered in a, an atmosphere, <coughs> Uh, and just shot in about 1978, uh, NASA sent the Pioneer spacecraft to Venus and it went into orbit around Venus and it actually landed probes. But these probes didn't have any, there was no TV cameras or anything on them. However, in 1975, the Soviet Union landed the Venera spacecraft on uh, Venus and I've got a picture of that come up in a minute or two you can see the surface. Uh, I don't think Venus is of any use to anybody unless you terraform it if that's possible. Uh, a, it's very similar size to the Earth, I think I've got a picture of that coming up. It's often been called the Earth's twin because of its uh, a similar size, but space probes have discovered that the environment there is actually quite inhospitable. It has a very thick atmosphere, 96.5% carbon dioxide, <coughs> It has 3.5% uh, nitrogen plus trace gases. Uh, so the, on the surface, the air pressure is 90 times that of the Earth. Uh, the temperature is stifled 870 Fahrenheit, uh, 465 Celsius, with winds up to 220 miles per hour. Uh, we reckon it's got a metal core. It's not known if this core is solid. Unlike the Earth, being a sweet magnetic field is not produced by a dynamo in the core, and it has a diameter of 7,520 miles, or 12,100 kilometres, so just slightly, in that picture there, I've got a bigger one in a minute too, it is slightly smaller than the Earth, and there's a, a surface from the Venus start when it was done in 1982. So, uh, which was the one that forgot to take the lens cap off? Uh, was that been or something? Yeah, that was a yeah, was Russian one. Well, was that been? Didn't they get any pictures? Right. Right. Uh, so NASA is actually currently planning a, a Venus lander at the moment. So they always talk about a, a, re, a return mission to Venus. Uh, over the years, the various people have thought about putting uh, balloons in the atmosphere and all the rest of it. But how long would they last? I mean, it's, it's not uh, very nice. Uh, through the telescope, we can't see any features at all. We could try, can try by sometimes if you use filters, you can uh, bring up, uh, sometimes you get some patchy clouds that you, you might see. It's all rather a shame because if you went back about 80 or 90 years ago, the science fiction writers thought that uh, if you went to holidays to Venus, it'd be tropical beaches, <laughs> the year of the sun, uh, and there'd probably be dinosaurs and all the rest running around. And unfortunately, it's not like that. Uh, Venus is the nearest star coming to hell that you could possibly get. What is it, sulfuric acid rain? Sulfuric acid rain. <laughs> now, shortly after Duncan's, a few years after, or well, about 10 years after Duncan's book was published, uh, the space shuttle launched the Magellan spacecraft to Venus and that got there in 1990. It went into orbit and it used radar mapping to penetrate the clouds. Uh, and since then, the European Space Agency has sent Venus Express. That was a bit more recent, I can't remember what that was. Uh, so uh, these are some of the images. Uh, it's a diagram we are looking through to the, the core. Uh, and what we see uh, when we go below the, the clouds is, is three continents, just like the Earth's got continents, obviously there's no oceans, they've also all boiled away. And because of the intense uh, atmospheric pressure, we see a lot of the volcanoes are compressed like donuts because of the intense. Uh, I think this one here is called Mount Maxwell, uh, is quite, quite high. Uh, as Venus is the, the god of love, 
most of the features on Venus are named after famous women scientists and astronomers. Uh, this is a chart showing the atmosphere of uh, Venus uh, and all these different CO2, all that, these colours representing all the different stuff in it. So I mean, I would suggest that Venus is totally useless for us whatsoever. The only use that Venus will have in the exploration of the solar system is, is for manned flights to Mars. Because by launching rockets we can use Venus either at certain times as a gravity assist sling slingshot to go to Mars, or on the way home you can go via uh, from Mars uh, behind the sun via close to Venus and that speed you up fan frame weirds. But whether we would want to use Venus, that picture there shows uh, the relative uh, sizes to the the Earth and Venus. And the Earth is in an area in space that we call the uh, the Goldilocks zone, and the Goldilocks zone it means it's not too hot and it's not too cold. So the conditions are kind of right for life. Uh, so Venus is too hot and Mars is just at the edge, it's too cold. So at the current situation, we are, we are okay. Uh, this is a picture from 1975, uh, and the Venera spacecraft that landed. And I think it transmitted back pictures for about 20 minutes before it pointed out. Uh, and interesting, of course, the, uh, the, the Russians used the Baird mechanical process because there's no way that you could use cathode break tubes and all that, the primitive electronic TV systems of the 1970s. Uh, uh, so it's done on 19, good old 1920s technology, which works. <laughs> uh, it's, yeah, and I did, when I did a talk about uh, uh, how mechanical TV is, is used to create a lot in the space program. This is an artist's concept of terraforming of Venus. I've heard a lot of terraforming of Mars, you know, so I've not really heard anybody go on about terraforming Venus and how that would be, would be done. So I've just put in the Earth, I just went through that as our own planet, as we all know. We are 93 million miles from the sun, uh, so we're in that area, it's not too hot, it's not too cold. About 80% of our planet is covered in water, and that's the basis of the, uh, one of the building blocks you obviously need for life. Uh, we've got solid core, and uh, so I'll dig on about the Earth. So not a lot about the Earth because we're here to talk about space. Of course, we, I mean, we stopped going nowhere now. For, it's quite scary for almost 40 years. Uh, we had a national space station with a mission to nowhere, it's going around in circles endlessly. Uh, so it's really time that, and people are now beginning in China and in Europe and in, uh, in the United States and even in the UK. You can't say backward Britain anymore. I used to talk about backward Britain, but we now have a space program, so we're not and we are involved. So. I think the real thing of interest, obviously, is the moon. And this is a uh, diagram of the Earth's magnetic field <coughs> from the, the, the Van Allen radiation belts. And I got all these idiots telling me that they didn't go to the moon. No, it was all filmed in a TV studio by Stanley Kubrick. Because you could not fly through the Van Allen belts, you know. And also, there's one bomb through there. So here's something. <laughs> so I think uh, I, I'm, I'm a, unashamedly I'm part of the, the back, what we call the back to the moon crowd because I'm a child of Apollo and when I was a little kid you know I watched people going to the moon uh, and uh, nowadays I get a chance to meet up with these guys every so often and drink pints and beer in the pub you know and the hotel bar they're all unfortunately getting very old now and we need to we need to go back to the moon. And I think the one of the biggest exciting thing about the moon since Duncan's book was published in 1979 is we now know of course that there's water on the moon. And not only is the water on the moon, there's vast amounts of water on the moon, which is buried underneath the north and south poles. Uh, and uh, the moon is only four days away from the Earth. Uh, China is again has taken a giant step forward in its 
space program the launch of that space shuttle and the, a heavier rocket at the weekend and uh, they are due to launch uh, a new space station over the next couple of months and in October two astronauts will be going up and they will dock with that space station and this will be China's first long term space mission. Up to now the China astronauts are uh, spent a week in space so they're now going to do a Skylab type flight of maybe 90 days or something. Uh, in next year, China is going to send a lunar module uh, to land on the far side of the moon. And satellite, and this has never been done before, and the satellite space can't get to the orbit, there will really be television images back to the Earth. And then in 2018 or 2019, if the, this one box goes okay, uh, they will send another spacecraft which will land somewhere in the front. It's probably going to be what talk about this area down here. And the last one they did, of course, was up, up here, just for the, 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 right there. So the next landing site is this one here, Sea Fertility, I think it is. Uh, and it's going to be a sample return mission. And that will be the first sample return mission we've had since the Soviets in 1976. And if that works, then that's a giant step forward to putting astronauts on the moon. Because the lunar module that China's using this is basically the prototype for the manned lunar module. Uh, China is also now talking about a kind of ripoff of the Orion spacecraft. Uh, which will replace the Chinzu. Uh, the Chinzu is based on the, the, the General Electric Apollo proposal from the early 60s, which NASA rejected and the Russians copied. Uh, and what the Chinese have done is they just scaled it up and made it bigger. So the Moon, uh, a lot of interest in the Moon, the European Space Agency is really interested in the Moon. I have to stress here that the European Space Agency has got absolutely nothing to do with the European Union. You might have seen the UKIP TV broadcast, and they threw something at the, 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 phone, the, the TV, which said that, and you know that the EU wastes your money on a space programme. And of course the United Kingdom was the forerunner in setting the European Space Programme up in 1963, uh, and it, it includes Canada. Uh, and the European Space Agency, what they want to do is build a, a lunar village. East, uh, EU has now got a 20% stake in the European Space Agency. And that money is used for a military space program called Galileo, which is a military sold to the public as a, a, a GPS. In reality, it's for a European Defence Force. And it's the first stage of a three-pronged Star Wars program. Uh, paper and aviation week and space technology would say that the EU would like to centralise the European Space Agency so that they can take total control and aim more money into defence right. spending. I want it to remain separate, you know. Well, uh, don't forget, though, Robert, GPS itself is American military. Yeah, well, this is a European military. Chinese military. Yes, military. yes uh, <laughs> because what actually happened, Andy, yeah. is that when the time President Bush uh, and a lot of people in Washington are great concerned why the Europeans doing this, this is a security risk, uh, and then even worse, the ESA let China in on this program, uh, and Washington was having kittens. Two years later, China exited the European Space Project, uh, copied the military spacecraft, and the People's Liberation Army has now outstripped the EU because they've now got almost a global constellation. Mm -hmm. So, and it's really for your troops on the ground. I want civil space. I want science, the peaceful scientific explanation of space. Uh, but the European Space Agency wants a, uh, what they call a lunar village. Uh, and that is, we starts off with robots on the moon, with 3D printers, printing uh, out the stuff to make a moon base, and then astronauts are uh, going to the moon. Uh, I did talk a wee bit about that in, in the talk that I did for Duncan and Trun the other night, they had the latest idea on mini space stations uh, for lunar orbit. 
so the Russians about 10 years ago uh, produced a lot of stuff about, again, a moon village uh, with robots that would land on the moon and do stuff. Uh, and then and that could go the, the way for the, the future. Uh, since uh, Duncan's uh, book was published in 1979, uh, after a gap of about 10 years, uh, the American Strategic Defense Initiative, uh, President Reagan's Star Wars organization, sent a satellite uh, to the moon, uh, and it actually and it was involved in various military experiments, orbit changes, and I forget the, the name of that spacecraft and it imaged the Apollo 15 landing site. Uh, and of course, as we all know, 10 years ago, the Americans were going back to the moon. They had spent something in a region of about 30, uh, what was it, 30 million dollars, <coughs> some folks, when that was a billion dollars, developing a system. Uh, and as part of that system, they sent the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter this is how um, get these pictures, which gave us the, and um, this is in high definition, but the, uh, the images are all actually in the original and high definition. And it marked the moon to look for landing sites for American astronauts. American astronauts were uh, going back to the moon by 2020. But as we all know, Obama was elected, and of all the candidates, he had the worst space policy, and he shut the program down. Uh, Ten years on, the Americans are, are effectively grounded and totally dependent on Russians. And I fear what is happening about the moon, because you just if you think it's what's bad about Brexit, what's going on here, look at the American presidential election. What's NASA's future going to be? Uh, Donald Trump thinks that potholes are more important than space. And Hillary has made three major speeches on her space policy on ufology and Roswell and getting to the grip of new force. So I am very concerned about where is NASA going because a lot of people, maybe it will be <coughs> an industry, uh, though Elon Musk seems to, doesn't seem to be interested in the moon, he's very interested in going to Mars, we'll talk about Mars in a minute or two. Uh, I think, the, I think uh, there is a, a change now of uh, way the asteroid retrieval mission has been cancelled and that was a piece of nonsense. I did give a talk to Astro about 10 years ago on the GCBS and that was quite interesting because there was a lot of studies about what asteroids that we could visit with our eye. And that, that was quite exciting because we're now even today, there's two private companies in America and more recently there's a company in Luxembourg has been set up, space com commercial space companies, to mine the asteroids. And that may be for resources in the solar system. That is going to be a bit more important over time. Uh, but I think there is a, a move now away to, to, it went from going to an asteroid to then bringing an asteroid to the lunar orbit uh, and the astronauts going there so, uh, to visit. So effectively, it defeats the process because we're not going any further than what we did in 1968. Uh, and now that was scaled back again with the Planetary Society, who have always been almost anti human space flight, had a big conference to get it changed and talk to politicians in Washington. And then they got it changed, it was then reduced to a, a, a probe going out and not bringing an asteroid back, just bringing a rock off an asteroid back to the lunar orbit and then astronauts would go. And it's just absolute nonsense because the price of that, how many you could have tens of 50 robotic space missions could be funded to go and visit. So that project, I'm quite pleased, has been scrapped. And um, what we're now looking at is a man-tended shelter, which is a mini space station. And it fits in with the, the kind of evolving space program that they talked about, you know, instead of going to the moon, they would just go to start the space station and move out and out, you know. So we're looking at space stations, uh, NASA, uh, all the, some of the commercial companies like ATK have, have done this whole series of studies over the last six months. There was a big conference in Washington. And that is possibly seen as the next step beyond the ISS, when the 
within the next three to five years, maybe. Uh, so we could have space stations near the moon, and if we have space stations near the moon, we can have uh, landers, robotic landers, and when the UK astronaut, a major peak, uh, he was on the space station, he carried out an experiment where he was controlling a robot in a place down in England from the International Space Station, space. Uh, so in future, what it shows that we can, well, astronauts orbit the moon, maybe able to control robots to pick up rocks and do things on, on the moon. Uh, this is, I think this is the south pole of the moon. Uh, and if I've got that right, then that there, right in the middle, was Shackleton Crater. And we know there's a huge quantity of water here, and that was one of the, the landing sites that the Americans were going to, to do. The European Space Agency is talking about sending a Merman lander to the moon to land here to find out about the water and all that. So in the future, uh, the moon could be used as a stepping stone. As this is for President Bush, uh, at his time of his space exploration initiative, they were going back to the moon and then using that then to go into Mars. And there was a lot of debate, it was a lot of nonsense, why do you need to go to the moon and all that? They just going straight to Mars and all the rest of it. Uh, and there's a whole lot of reasons why you want to go to the moon, because it's easier to launch a rocket from the moon than it is from the Earth. And if you can produce rocket fuel on the moon, it's a staging force. Uh, Europe has been suggesting putting a, a manned space station at the L1 point. Yes, uh -huh. I could do a talk. I've got a talk I'd like to do, you asked for about that, Andy. Uh -huh. yeah. And Duncan may look at that. I was doing a talk about the Kennedy Space Centre uh, yeah. uh, the other night down in Trim that I was, you know, I, was, I, I gave them an update, and apart from uh, holiday pictures of a uh, space holiday that Yvette christened it's going to be on a space holiday that I have uh, I've got a I've got like you know I did a wee bit about what is actually going on in Florida because people say why do you want to go to Cape Canaveral because there's no space program and nothing happens anymore and actual fact there's a lot happening there yeah, it's <laughs> <the deep. laughs> anyway so that is the moon and I think they we've so we're now going an awful lot more about the moon uh, since the time of Duncan's books. Uh, so this is, this is a diagram here that uh, we think it's a bit set. It brings an inner core, a solid core, an outer core, which part is liquid, parts are partial melt and a mantle. And again, another interesting thing is that the, looking at the satellite imagery of the Apollo landing sites, there was a lot of debate whether the lunar module bases would still be there. Because people thought that uh, if you go back, there'd be a lot of meteorite impacts and all the rest of it, and uh, that the residual rocket fuel would be getting boiled up during the day, it was something like plus 250 above boiling. At night time, it would be minus 250, uh, and then what's happening is you just get a big explosion, so we would go back to the Apollo landing sites, you get just a pile of rubber wreckage. No, that's not the case whatsoever. And what we see is that even the astronaut footprints are all still clearly there. The motor cars are still sitting there. All the landers are sitting in perfect condition. So what that is saying is that the, at the moment the meteor... It's, all, it's going to be a problem, you know, because you can't stop it. But it means that the meteorite bombardment on the moon's surface is not as bad is what people thought, you know, for future astronauts if they want to go back. Isn't it likely they've already been punctured, that's why nothing's going up? That may be, I don't know, it would be the the fuel's is, it's the fuel's escape. Oh, they, oh, maybe it is, but I don't know. <laughs> so that, that brings me to Mars, and I think of all the, all the planets in the, the solar system, you know, that will be the most interesting one, you know. Uh, the Americans will tell you that, uh, uh, like, uh, that they will land on Mars in the 2030s, you know, this is the current, you know. The um, only issue is that Obama has put no money in whatsoever, and, uh, and the money that NASA has actually had its money actually increased under Obama, it has actually cut the budget. But the problem is that what NASA is directed to do, it is doing too many things, so it's gets spread the money spread thinner. Uh, we've been 20 years, I think it's quite a 
Charles Bold in the National Ministry, I made a speech. Uh, Ella, it was at Ella Winder, she was late last year. And I thought it was quite hilarious, you know, the official Obama position, that we are 20 years away from Mars. Now, we've been 20 years away from Mars since the 1940s. Uh, in the 1950s, Werner von Braun made a huge study about how we could put people on Mars in the 50s. The only problem cost a bloody fortune. Uh, he scaled that back in the, 19, the late 50s, but his mission went from 50 astronauts down to about 30 or something, and that was just a nonsense. So in the 60s, the Boeing company, working, I think, with von Braun, brought out the the thermal nuclear electric propulsion and got it down to maybe a crew of seven. And in 1969, Werner von Braun came out with the fall up to Apollo uh, and we would have had astronauts on Mars in 1981 and in 1986 uh, and the Mars colony as early as 1990. Trouble was it cost a hell of a lot of money and President Nixon wanted a second term in office, and you do that by cutting the budget and saving money, and the whole thing was scrapped. Uh, the Russians, it's very interesting, is that the Soviets were actually studying human missions to Mars before Yuri Gagarin even left the lunch pad, which is absolutely incredible. And in the 1980s, or uh, in the 70s and the 80s, the Russians did uh, an awful lot of work on human missions to Mars. And the Mir space station was part of a Mars program because what they wanted to see was whether astronauts could uh, survive the long periods of space, like flight times of like a year and a half. And, you know, in October, I'm going to be meeting Mark Kelly and uh, uh, his brothers, the twin astronauts, you know, and uh, one of them spent a year on the ISS. We well, didn't really, the Americans tell me he spent a year, it was just under about a couple of weeks. And the Americans are making a big song and dance about this, much to the amusement of the Russians, because they did this 30 years ago. Uh, and the Mir core module, the Mir space station, is basically like a spaceship that you could send to Mars. And the Americans, in the 1970s, if you ever see the the film with Sean Connery in it called Meteor, it's quite interesting. You see Skylab going to Mars. And in 1979, the year of Duncan's book, I went to see it in Glasgow, and I fell around laughing in the cinema. You see Skylab going to Mars, well, that's no bloody nonsense. <laughs> but now I know it was not a lot of nonsense, and it was perfectly serious. Uh, and that could, because you needed, you couldn't go to Mars in a little bit of a capsule, you know, for six and a half months, you know, not a bit of time. So uh, that's what I would, would, would do it, you know. Uh, so NASA say that they want to go to Mars. China's starting to be a bit interested in Mars. They're going to be sending a space probe. Uh, they tried with the Russians, but they, they got lost, you know, that day. Uh, so uh, China's now looking at uh, uh, maybe so we may go back to Mars. Uh, so again, it's got a, a, a diagram here. Its diameter is 4,222 miles, 6,734 kilometers. So it's about half the size of the Earth. A day on Mars is 24 hours, exactly like the Earth, which is 23 hours. But it's a great one, even the school teachers get it wrong when they come to the observatory and say it. How long's a day on the Earth? No, tell me it's 24 hours. Wrong. <laughs> Uh, a year on Mars is two years, <coughs> and, uh, and then that's how we have to we get conjunction and opposition class missions. We get uh, a, a lineup of Mars, the planet, every two years we get a good one. And in some years we get a really good one. Uh, so later, next month, Elon Musk is going to make a major announcement about Mars next month. Because what he is proposing to do is from every launch window every two years, SpaceX is going to launch a Dragon capsule to Mars. And that will make it cheaper for other countries who might not be able to afford the space program or for universities, educational institutes and companies to send stuff to Mars. The Dragon capsule is totally incapable of putting astronauts on Mars are too small. 
Uh, however, in the future that may change. Uh, it's not the there was two commercial things. Uh, there's the Cowdown Nutters over in Holland, Mars Direct, I think it's called. Mars One. It's up sorry, Mars One. Uh, and well, they've got Nobel, Pri Nobel Prize winners yeah, on there too. What are they? All nutters. Yeah, a one way trip to Mars. That's yeah. right, you'll, get, you'll never be able to come back home. Bunkers. Uh, there was another interesting one that seems to have fell out of the news. I don't know if you, if you heard that it recently. Uh, by the the other one that the, the Mars that the Mars Direct was the orbital flight by the guy that was the first space tourist. What was his name again? Yes, I, I, uh, I've forgotten that. Yeah, now he. Yeah. This is really interesting because what he was proposing to do is send uh, a, uh, astronauts on a, a, a flight to Mars. This is what NASA was going to do in 1975, using the Saturn V. They were going to send astronauts to Mars, but they wouldn't land. They would have a close encounter on Mars, and then you go behind the sun, and you might be able to use Venus as a slingshot, and you come back again. And that would be almost a three-year round trip, which is a great, uh, a, a, uh, stepping stone. Um, we don't have a capability to do this at the moment. However, when the space launch system becomes available, we will have an availability to do it. He was trying to raise it uh, privately, and uh, that didn't seem to be getting anywhere. I mean, I had asked the various Congress people and politicians in the States, which I feel was supported, that NASA should be doing this. If NASA chipped in money, and we could have, you know, they could make this possible. And they, they were advertising, I think he was looking for a, preferably a middle-aged uh, couple that got on well with each other, because you'd be on a tin can going to Mars for a three-year round trip. And I think that would be a, a major stepping stone. So long as one didn't throw the other one out. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you're really going to get on with anybody uh, stuck at ten years in so three years. Uh, a a, a diagram of the last year. You pick your nose one more time. Which is uh, like 96% uh, consisting of CO2, or I think that's half going, 2%. I'm not sure what N is. We maybe Greg might know the reason. Nitrogen, that, that would be nitrogen, 2%, and then the other bit of that is 1%. But he has a very thin atmosphere on Mars, and you would need the space suit, no. Uh, so I think we will eventually get to, to Mars, but at the moment it is it's probably the 2030s, but it's going, or and some would rather depressingly say that the rate they're going, it'll probably be the 2060s. So that probably means that everybody in this room, or maybe the exception of Greg, will be there. Very old, <laughs> because I'd be about 100, you know, would see that, you know. Uh, uh, so, but Mars, again, is probably, of all the planets, probably the only one I think would be useful to us. We could maybe go to the moons and the outer planets, but the, uh, Mars is, uh, so that's the temperature. Uh, the Martian equator in summer, it's like 63 Celsius. Uh, it can vary from minus 143. Up uh, to, to 30, 35 up here. High ice clouds that we we see now because we've since Duncan's when Duncan wrote his book in 1979, the most recent thing then would have been Viking, and the was a long gap in the uh, American space program because Carter had slashed all the funding, uh, and then all the money that was then was getting developed into trying to get the shuttle, you know. And it took the Americans until the early 1990s, uh, and they, they got a cheap deal on an RCA, an RCA television satellite. And it, uh, at that time, I think it was, was it, a, it was, was it George Bush Sr. or was it Bill Clinton? I can't remember. It was, uh, they got, a, they got a, a deal on these satellites anyway on the cheap, and the idea was that it would send one to uh, Mars. And then you the, would have a backup, and then thought, what well, they could send one, they wouldn't send one to Mercury. Um, they thought they'd got, because Dan Golden was the administrator at the time, and it was all about faster, better, and cheaper. 
And of course, as you all say, you get uh, what you pay for, uh, as what a lot of the TV audience found one night during an episode of the TV program Star Trek when the spacecraft exploded and the screens went blank. I love that to Sky, anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it has happened to Sky in Australia to, uh, on a, a slight variance on that when the Sky satellite went away and all disappeared. Uh, and what then happened was that the, we were getting the first, I watched live on satellite, the launch on CNN, and we went to the six month flight and we were starting to get the, the pictures back and then the valve, there was a kind of fault, it, it, the spacecraft blew up and the face on Mars people told us that what was going on was that NASA was hiding the face on Mars and aliens, so that's all nonsense. It's what happens. So there was a long gap again, and then we had various, the most successful one of course was the Sojourner in 1997, where they landed a little toy car, smaller than a microwave oven, and then as we know we went on to the Mars Exploration rovers, which were, they were only meant to last for six months in 2004, and one of them still working today, it's incredible. And now we've got a nuclear powered vehicle, Curiosity, uh, which is uh, uh, the size of a Land Rover, and Obama has given the first kind of major, and the only space program he's actually, big program he's actually initiated, he's given the funding for a second one of these cars, which was due to go to Mars in 2020. Uh, it's a very thin atmosphere on Mars. Uh, you can see in that there's a lot more recent topographical. That is not water, but maybe there, there is water on Mars and it's underneath the ground. The Mars, like the Earth, is a huge climate change. There's a global warming and global freezing. And what's actually happened on Mars is I believe that it's actually heating up again. And how can I tell you that? Because you've had satellites in orbit around Mars since the, since the 1990s and the monitoring conditions. And there has been a few areas where there's evidence to look like the signs of some water coming to the surface. Bob Zubrin wrote his book, it's quite got on for quite a while ago, The Case for Mars, and he talks about uh, land, astronauts landing on Mars or sending a spacecraft that processes its own fuel on Mars for their journey back to the Earth. In situ, uh, a propelled refueling. I haven't heard much about him lately, I must admit. Uh, okay, so unfortunately I think uh, there was a kind of falling out in the Mars Society and then obviously the way, the way that things are going, it's, it was really bad now in the American space industry and the way that the space program unfortunately has deteriorated over the last 10 years. Uh, he seems oh. to be kept in a low profile, you know, I, I don't... Uh, the the Mars Society is still going, you know. Oh. They were in effect and we got caught with his fingers. In the it did, it was taking it money it for one project and he was spending it in a different way. The money was given to pay for one project and he was spending it on his own. But project. apparently Elon Musk is now getting accused of doing the same thing. I thought he spent his own uh, money at least. Uh, because he's got these electric cars, you know, and apparently it's funded by extracting money from SpaceX to keep it going, you know. Uh, right. And it's in the car and then he's extracting money from that and something else. And this is, uh, somebody said, well, how, wait, wait until Ellen gets interested in trains and then it's all going to come down like a pack of cars. Hyperloop. Sorry? Hyperloop. Hi yeah, Hyperloop, yeah. <laughs> well, so, well, Elon uh, Musk plans yeah. to go to Mars himself. So yeah, he does. He, he, he so, will. he is, uh, uh, he is uh, NASA has actually now ordered SpaceX, they've come up with that. Spaceship, I was talking about that action uh, for the commercial crew, and also the NASA actually placed an yeah. order to SpaceX for that. It's coming up. So I don't know why, but Bob Zubrin there seems to be uh, a. Let's take the back seat. So this is the. This is the Martian atmosphere, so that's like uh, carbon, oxygen, and atomic hydrogen. This is another topographical map of Mars. What has been found in Mars recently is indications of methane. 
reading which is suggesting that there will be about life on Mars is coming up again, you know, uh, as the microorganisms on Mars. And of course, when the Viking, it's quite controversial when the Viking land up, landed in 1976, and it did its tests. There's one of these scientists writing that detected life on Mars, but that was disputed. Uh, so recently, we've seen the indications of uh, a possible methane gas outgassing on Mars. So there may be uh, something like that on Mars, which is when, when is it on Mars? Now uh, that's got put back again, isn't it? There we are. <laughs> uh, I'm not. Was the I'm not sure about that. Yes. Is the one that is the one that one not, one was launched the Pathfinder? Is that not on its way? But the lander, there's a satellite going in the Europe yeah. side of Mars. That's on its way now, is it not? Uh, I think it was launched last month. Or month. There, there is, yeah, part uh -huh. of it is, is gone. And, and the UK is working on the lander. So I think they made sure mm -hmm. one of the, but I don't, it's been cut, in cutbacks. There is going to be a major uh, now, meeting of the. Concentrating yeah. on the life. That yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there is going to be a major European space ministers meeting in, the, in November. And one of the things that's on the agenda is the future of the ISS. Because Obama wanted to extend it, you know. To me, it's like a sop to get away from funding a proper space program going back to the moon or Mars to 2020. And or then that was extended to 2024. So Obama has agreed the Americans would extend it to 2024. The Russians actually want to go a stage further. They want to keep it going till maybe 2029, 20, 2030. Uh, the Japanese have agreed to keep it going. And Canada is the most recent uh, player to say, yes, we would like to extend to 2024. Everybody has agreed except Europe. So that decision of whether what was Europe will continue in the ISS, I assume it will, I don't expect it. If everybody else is going there, I think it'd be staff for Europe to say no. So when that uh, uh, comes up, then whether they, they also discuss the robotic stuff, what is... Well, Europe itself originally proposed that it be extended to 2025. Mm -hmm. so the problem, of course, is the ISS is lifetime ended last year. Mm -hmm. And what happens, because it was meant to get phased out as we went back to the moon, these things don't last forever. The Mir space station had a lifetime of five years. Mm -hmm. The Russians managed to keep it going for ten years. But they, they could have, they had to cancel it because they couldn't afford to do it on the ISS. They probably could have uh, kept Mir going for 15 years. But the problem is that the longer the ISS is going to be up there now, the more, as it gets older, the more maintenance. That's and the astronauts and cosmonauts' time are going to be spent just if you buy a second-hand car, it's going to need a lot more maintenance than if you had a brand new car. Mars has got two moons, Phobos and Dimus, and it's seen that maybe astronauts will be able to land on them before we go to land on Mars. So, because it's easier, you do, you do not need the big Delta V, you don't need the big Mars excursion module, you can do it with a little tiny lander. And it may be possible that with these, we may see the first human missions to Mars. And the, even uh, if Elon Musk is talking about it, you know, in the, 20, in the 20, late 20s. Uh, and maybe you might see, in the, the, the late 20s, early 30s, you might see people landing on Phobos and Dimas first, and then eventually landing on the planet itself. And they are also captured, Rob Setley, it's focus uh, and Dimas captured asteroids. So there is a lot of minerals, there's water we now know in the asteroids, the uh, maybe diamonds or maybe other precious stones, I don't know. There's a lot of interest and it's seen that there may be a future in sending people to the asteroids. As I say, there's two private companies have been formed in America and in Europe and Luxembourg. A couple of months ago, a company was set up. And initially, this would be done with a robotic spacecraft 
and then eventually you could see humans going to asteroids. So moving on from the asteroids to the uh, planets, this is the big one, <coughs> the big event of 2016, as I'm talking to you at the moment, the Juno spacecraft, uh, which President Bush gave the go-ahead for not only over 10 years ago, is now approaching uh, Mars, sorry Mars, it's approaching Jupiter, uh, uh, it will fire its rocket engine, which will put it into orbit around, it's critical of that, and the engine's made in the UK, so you get your fingers crossed. Uh, that will be, if it fails, it will be a flop and it will just pass Jupiter. But hopefully it will work. And it's made it, under EU regulations. I'm not going to, it's like it's going to fail then. Uh, if I, uh, I will be getting home, I will not get home to about 1 o'clock in the, the morning. Uh, so by the time I get home, it should be tonight, in the, in the it should hopefully Andy be in orbit. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jupiter, obviously, nobody could land on Jupiter. You have weighed 10 times your Earth weight. No, it's not solid, obviously. It has long been seen as uh, the gases and all that, the Jovian atmosphere, could be used for fueling starships and all that high floating sci fi stuff. Uh, and when I joined Astra in the 70s, it was quite, uh, in the late 70s, it was quite. Uh, an exciting time in Astra. Uh, we had lights of, uh, we were the run up to the shuttle, we were getting all the Ellis after illustrations, uh, we were having the, the Enterprise drop tests, you know, uh, we had Voyager, uh, we had Pi the Pioneer, and then Vo well, that was the early 70s, but we had Pioneer approach Saturn in 79, and then Voyager. Uh, we were we were just getting to grips with the Erect Observatory at Airtrain Library and things were getting really exciting and we had our huge space exhibition on in the Third Eye Centre and at the time one of the things that we did in Astor was the colonisation game and uh, in the late 70s Gerard O'Neill at Princeton was talking about large space colonies, giant space stations uh, and the British Interplanetary Society had worked out a, a, a space probe called Daedalus that would go to a, a nearby star. They did a study in the, the 70s, just after the Apollo period. Uh, it would have a flight time of 50 years. Uh, and Duncan did a lot of talk about scaling. If you scaled Daedalus up, you made it bigger. And that's what the Americans did with nuclear power stations. They scaled up for an atomic submarine reactor to make a, a nuclear power, an atomic power station. Uh, and you, block, you put on one of these, uh, engine onto one of these O'Neill habitats, and then you could get within the light speed of 10% of the speed of light. It's quite interesting. And you could go to Jupiter and use the material in Jupiter to fuel. Uh, and then you also use Jupiter's like a gravitational assist to take you out the solar system. And you pick a star and you go to a star uh, and look for a habitable planet. And you have to make a lot of it was an Earth like planet. Uh, and, and that is another thing now is I saw for the first time a, uh, an actual image of a planet. At long last, this has now happened, that was released uh, two weeks ago going around another star uh, and you you could then refuel your spacecraft to presumably a Jupiter type planet and you can come you can make a decision you if there's no if there is a planet you inhabit you, you stop there or you can stay in your space colony you just put it in the orbit around the star at a similar distance to what the earth would be so the conditions are right or you, you, know, you just come back home, so you've been away for quite a year. I think you come back in the future and you've been away for a hell of a long time. Or you make that decision, which there is a decision of no return once that is committed, you that can't change it. You, you use the gas plant like Jupiter to fuel the rocket and you ignite it and then go into another star. And when you do that, you would never be able to come back home. So in the future, I believe that Jupiter may be the atmosphere of Jupiter may be used for fueling spaceships. Uh, 
So the it's huge. Uh, you could get more than 1,200 Earths in, in, in its diameter. Has an enormous magnetic field. In fact, the uh, the Juno spacecraft has got an awful lot of it's like a tank. We've talked about it in Sky News this morning. It has got shielded because of the radiation of Jupiter. Uh, it has dozens of moons, an enormous magnetic field. Uh, it has giant ball of gas and liquid, a uh, dark ring system composed of fine dust grains. So it's 89.8% hydrogen, 10.2% helium, plus trace gases. Uh, gravity, it says they're 2.4 off air. I used to think that, they used to say that Jupiter was 10 times that in the Earth's gravity, you know. So let's say that if you were 200 pounds on the Earth, it'd be 480 pounds. At the time that Duncan had produced this book, I think that's at the sort of apparent surface of Jupiter. Apparently. Uh, at the time when, you get to, when you get to right. Saturn, they say right. at, at the apparent surface of Saturn, uh -huh. your weight would be the same as Earth. Uh, at the time of Duncan's book, uh, you look at pictures of the detail of Jupiter we had, uh, at that point was when he was writing it, obviously it was Pioneer uh, 10, which encountered Jupiter 1973, and they used the Baird spotlight kind of thing where the space spacecraft was spinning uh, with a, a photo cell to scan the images on a mechanical TV system. We have very primitive images. Uh, and shortly after Duncan's book was published, Voyager 2 encountered Jupiter, I remember that in 1979, because my dad at long last, who drank most of his money in the pub, and managed to persuade him to get a prop. We just got up over the last the street to get a proper colour television. And I have vivid memories of Duncan Lunan, Linda Lunan, that's L1, and Jean Coles of the Astro and the Astronomy Project coming to my house at Linwood to watch the colour pictures of Jupiter on the news and on the Skyline programme, you know. And so that was just after. And then, of course, we, had, we found out a lot about Jupiter and its moons with Voyager. Uh, and then in the 1990s, we had Galileo that went into orbit. And this year we're going to find uh, a lot more. And that has been added, it's just a link to show that uh, the kind of size of the, the Earth and the Moon system, you have roughly four moons across the Earth's diameter. And, uh, and I think it's like, uh, here's the Jupiter and the, the Earth and the Moon and the Sun to the same scale. And you could get, I think it's 11 Earths across the uh, Jupiter's disk. Uh, there's one missing there because this is showed that the red spot is roughly the red spot is roughly the size of the, the Earth, and you can get 11 Jupiters across the sun's disk. One of the things that we have found out since uh, uh, New Worlds for Old and Man and the Planets were published is that uh, Jupiter gets hit by comets and possibly asteroids as well. Uh, and some people suggest the only reason why there's still life on this planet is that the Jupiter protects the Earth from cometary or asteroid strikes because a, a lot of them will end up crashing into Jupiter. And you may remember Schumacher Levy 9, and I think it was like 84. Uh, and since then, uh, we've discovered lots of as technology, even amateur astronomers now. In the days of digital imaging and all that stuff that we've got now. And there was one of these events a couple of months ago. Jupiter's moons are very interesting. My favourite, of course, is Io, to call the pizza planet. It's like cheese and tomato pizza. Uh, I think this one's Callisto, it's completely bombarded. Uh, uh, and I think it's. I looked at all these mix ups. That's and Europa. Europa, yeah. And Europa is very interesting. Europa has now taken over from Mars. It's the most likely place in the solar system to find alien life. Uh, well, I should say, I was discussing this with Duncan the other night there that the, uh, uh, in the 60s, Carol Sagan was proposing that there might be creatures floating around inside Jupiter's atmosphere, like balloon-like airship-type creatures, half and around. 
So it may be interesting that the Juno thing, it's going to need a polar orbit around Jupiter, you know, and it's going to be very close that we've ever been with us. Any such weird life forms in Jupiter's atmosphere remains to be seen. However, Europa is very interesting, and uh, they reckon there is, there's a frozen ocean, and it's warm, and a lot of scientists believe that there is life. So th this has been quite controversial in America because apparently NASA doesn't want to do it, you know, but the politicians, both the Democrats and the Republicans in the Congress, fight the battle uh, with the Obama administration to get them to fund. To, so NASA has now been ordered <coughs> by the US government to start putting money into a mission to a lander on Europa. And that would be probably now at some time in the 2020s. So a lot of scientists are quite interesting, interested in Europa, that what we might find there. So it may be possible, you can forget about the pizza planet, that in uh, 79 NASA grew up huge charts, maps. The Voyager 2 got there first. And Voyager 1, we had to throw all the maps in the bin because it changes, it's not solid. So don't think anybody that has to get radiation it's not a nice place. Just what made me point out one little thing here, Robert. Mm -hmm. The most interesting of these moons as far as human settlement is concerned is Callisto. Callisto. Because it's, it's the only one. one of the four that is outside the radiation, the radiation belt, belt, which is murderous. Yeah. A human being yeah. would not survive for more than minutes. If <laughs> you would survive under the ice in Europa, and the ice is very hard to get there. And then a very, very uh, good lot job. of work done on human missions to the Jo Jovian system. Yeah. And the the von Braun Mars stuff in the sixties, the other spacecraft could do that because I would take you three and a half years to get there. However, if there was a Mars colony of people living on Mars, and you were leaving from Mars rather than the Earth the flight time would be drastically reduced. I don't know how long the flight time from Mars to well, Jupiter would be. Maybe about be, a year and a half, I don't there, know. There might actually be colonies in between Mars and uh -huh. the because you'd have uh, Ceres and possibly Vesta. I, I don't know about Pallas, it's peculiar. But uh, certainly Ceres and Vesta before you get there. And the other big thing that Voyager discovered in 1979 was that Jupiter has a ring system. Uh, the, I think in the 70s there was a lot of speculation that Uranus had rings because it went in front of a star. And it was like, you know. So we know, of course, that all the gas planets have rings. Yeah. And in these ring systems there's also moons. And then moving on to Saturn, one of my favourite short science fiction stories by Arthur was Saturn, was it Saturn Rising? This is a brilliant little story. And it's about a kid that makes his own three inch telescope and goes up top of the roof to see the rings of Saturn and he ends up becoming an astronaut, so I'm going in a space mission to Saturn. Uh, when Duncan's book was published in 1979, the Pioneer 11 had I just arrived. I can also remember I had vivid memories of going to an astronaut meeting in Hamilton uh, and Duncan coming in with the big yellow envelope uh, and opening up this yellow envelope and we're all sitting around with cups of coffee. And this is the images, the colour pictures of Saturn from Pioneer. Because back in the day, in the 70s, there was no internet, there was nothing, you know, no satellite TV. And what you did is you wrote a letter to NASA. And about a month, two months later, I think the postman thought it was a big yellow envelope, you know. And we saw the, the first images. And then in November 1980, Voyager encountered Saturn. And then Voyager 2, Voyager 1 in 1981. Uh, so we found out a lot about Saturn. Uh, uh, it's the most distant planet which can be seen with the unaided eye. Um, Galileo first became the first person to look at Saturn through a telescope in 1610. So a strange year-like shapes at the sides of the, the planet because his telescope wasn't good enough to you know, 
So we had to wait to Christina Huygens, who came along in 1650 for that. Uh, of all the planets, if you put them in a giant ocean, it all sink except Saturn, and it's bob along in the top. Uh, it has a hydrogen atmosphere at 96.3 percent. It's helium 3.25 percent. A trace amounts of methane and ammonia. Uh, so you could do a 10 foot and dunk the basketball on the Earth, <laughs> and a Saturn that would be 9.4 feet. It has a huge moon Saturn, a Titan, uh, which is quite. But I'll talk about that in a minute too. We think there's a tiny core of rock and metal. Some quartz that may be the size of the Earth that's surrounded by thick layers of metallic hydrogen. Uh, Saturn is oblate, meaning that it's wider at the equator than at the poles. The Saturn's equatorial diameter of 74,898 miles. It's about 9.4 times the size of the Earth. And a year is something like 30 and a half Earth years, but a day I think it's about 10 hours and 50 minutes. So summer on Saturn lasts about seven and a half years. Not that there'd be any good to you on the freezing cold. So it's got molecular hydrogen, metallic hydrogen, hydrogen helium, methane gas. And again, like Jupiter, future space explorers might be able to use these gases for refueling spacecraft, etc. One of the interesting things uh, we've discovered about Saturn is the, the storms, the W.T. Hay, who was uh, an English amateur astronomer, he was also a comedy film star in the 30s, he uh, was a member of the British Astronomical Association, and in 1930 he saw a white spot on Saturn. And we now know that when Saturn uh, gets at the closest point in its orbit to the Sun, we tend to get uh, these, these huge storms. Um, and uh, this is a Cassini image, I think, uh, and we saw that in 1990, uh, I think, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Some images you can see. Uh, Saturn and Jupiter also have a aurora, just like what we have on the Earth. The rings appear to have moons, there's evidence that certain moons are actually forming in the rings. And this is the weird north and south poles of, of Saturn. It looks like a big hole, like an eye. No. So I don't know if the Juno will see something similar on Jupiter, but it's totally weird. Well, some of these pictures actually look like an Allen screw. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really does <laughs> look, you know, unscrew here. And it's, that, that, that's far, far more curved. It's actually straight edges. So anyway, so it's quite a complex system. And it's got something like, I think it's something almost 200 moons here. Oh. Ah. The most interesting one, of course, is Titan. Uh, and Titan is the size of Mars. It has, so it has an atmosphere. Uh, uh, some images. Uh, this is a fairly recent one. I like this. You can see the blue sky with the gates there, the clouds. Uh, it has uh, a liquid water ocean, normal ice surface, tetragonal crystals. I think it's got ammonia, I thought it had ammonia on Titan, uh, hydrosilicate core, and a lower atmosphere, thick fuel and haze in an upper atmosphere. There's even uh, work done at American universities has indicated there may even be life on Titan. And not just dumb life, but intelligent life. Mm -hmm. uh, the proper aliens, if you like. Right. Uh -huh. But uh, because uh, there may well have been life there for billions of years. What's their evidence? Uh, they found uh, how to make life here on Earth in laboratories that could actually live in the conditions on Titan. That is the kind of evidence they've got. And the, the chemicals that would be needed, are, they, they've already detected that from their probes. Uh, that the chemicals that are needed are, are on Titan mm -hmm. uh, for this stuff mm -hmm. that they made. Some people, you know, it's just saying it's feasible. Right. It's feasible so, to do the same uh, thing. It doesn't say it is there. No. It's feasible to do the same thing for Venus. Actually. Scientists uh, think that well well. uh, Titan resembles the primordial Earth. But it's far too cold for any life, something would freeze it. However, yeah, in the future... This particular type of light 
I mean, no. they, they actually made this stuff and that lived at these temperatures in the laboratory on Earth. So it can live well, in the kind in of the, in the get there. future, when the sun gets expands and it's no longer possible for life on this planet, the outer solar system will heat up. And maybe a life might begin. Well, so the point here, it's not that cold. It, ha it has a liquid water. Right. If it has a liquid ocean, then it's warm enough for life to survive, and it's warm enough for life probably right. to yes. right. So yeah. moving on to Uranus now, the uh, all up. the all the planets that I've talked yeah. about up to now, you can say. see in the sky without a telescope if you know where to look by the air visitor. And then when Duncan wrote his book in 1979, we knew next to nothing about Uranus. Uh, it was just a wee bit of moons, I think it's four moons, a green dot basically. Uh, it's interesting that uh, the English amateur astronomer, uh, what's his name, using the, the old telescope that's in the Mills Observatory when it was at four marks, W. H. Stevenson, in 1914, using the 10-inch cook that they used to call the Great Refractor when it was down in a uh, Fort Marks in Winchester, uh, he saw banding on Uranus, evidence of clouds. But when Voyager encountered Uranus 30 years ago this year, actually, 1986, uh, 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 we got a really bland, boring disc, and there was not a lot happening. So the some planet solar systems are uh, just a giant ball of gas and liquid, just tilted so far on its side that its axis lies nearly level with its path around the sun. And like the other gas uh, and these giants, Uranus is a thick cloud colour, it's blue green colour as a result of methane and its atmosphere. Uh, Smoggy atmosphere, 83% hydrogen, 15% helium, 2% methane plus trace gases. Uh, so the gravity was 0 0.9 of Earth, so you a dump on the Earth 10 foot, you'd only be 11 feet apparently on Uranus. The air pressure is 1.3 times that of the Earth, temperature 4,200 F or 2,300 Celsius, winds about 450 miles per hour. Uh, rocky core, the centre of Uranus may be a rocky core about the size of the Earth. More than 80% of the planet's mass is a fluid mix of water, methane and ammonia ices. It has a diameter of 31,763 miles, uh, so it's about over four times the size of the Earth. Uh, it takes, I think, about 87 years to go around. Uh, when Voyager flew past, it could only take a limited amount of images, and these are the, the, the moons. Uh, and uh, I remember that, I got have a vivid, uh, I remember the first encounter images being published in Sky and Telescope when I went to the Carl Sagan lectures, it was one of the nights of the Carl Sagan lectures at uh, Glasgow University, somebody showed me a copy of Sky and Telescope with the first Voyager picture, because that was the first I'd seen of it, and that was in October. Uh, the encounter happened on the 28th of the, on the 28th of the, it was the, the Challenger disaster happened on the 28th of January. And then the following day, the 29th of January, oh, that was the day that the Voyager encountered Uranus. So that it kind of spoiled the whole thing, it was an awful period. And on the same night that Voyager encountered Uranus, the Observatory was broken into. And I had did warn John Fox in 19, and Ian Downey in 1979 that they really need to put a lock in the door, but nobody would have been shot and nobody would listened to me. Uh, and these guys had climbed up onto the roof of the library and gotten in via the observatory door. And um, swung on the telescope, bust the weights, you know. First there was not a lot stolen or anything, but that was. And I remember showing some of the TV images on the air train of a... There's a lot of talk about, we need to send... A lot of planetary scientists think we, we really need to send, spend all the money endlessly on Mars, it's just like dumping more money into Mars. There's a lot of talk that we really need a, a, a Uranus orbiter, or a Neptune orbiter next. And that is what I would like to see NASA or the European Space Agency do. 
So what are we? I mean, you know, again, we have got long observatory on Titania. No, uh, that, that but again, we've got the problem. Of course, is that in the seventies the planets on a line up that we do gravitational no. slingshots. We can't do that anymore, and we're going to need to. All we can use is Jupiter, and we're going to have to probably need, use maybe a nuclear propulsion to do it. Well, to get the, it down the, to the our, Chinese are building a long, a long March five, which uh -huh. is a nuclear rocket. <laughs> Well, no, no, I don't know where it's, I don't, that was the one, that's the one that was launched on Saturday. As long no, as it's a nuclear one, no, 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 Long March 7 went, right. uh, that, is already, that was the one that went, uh -huh. but Long March 5 is very much larger. And it's got nuclear engines? It's got a nuclear engine, yes. And that's getting launched inside it's, the it's, 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 using, it's using, it's using uh, nuclear power to power ions. Yeah, it's at the upper stages, at the upper stages, yeah. you know, like, yeah, like the nerve at upper stages. Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a diagram of upper cloud layer, hard hydrogen, helium, methane, gases, mantle, water, ammonia, methane, ices, like the new core, silicate, phi, and then iron, that means what? Iron and nickel. Iron and nickel, right. This is some pictures. I don't know what that's taken to a very big telescope. I don't know if that's Hubble or an Earth based. Then moving on to Neptune, 1989, Voyager encountered Neptune, which was the last of. And Greg might remember when I brought the, the video camera down to the rocket weekend and oh, yeah. I edited a tape off of the stuff I've been recording off the TV. And we showed it in the Kelburn and the Kelburn place at the rocket we kept. Uh, we discovered that Neptune has a big dot. Again, it's like a storm system like uh, uh, Jupiter's red spot. So Neptune, uh, yeah, because it was discovered by mathematics, uh, the Weaveria uh, and Adams. It first observed in 1846, it takes more than 165 Earth years to complete one orbit the Sun. Found two probe visited Neptune in 1989, found a great dark spot in the atmosphere, but more recent photos show the spot has since vanished. So it's an 80% hydrogen, 90% helium plus ices of ammonia and water. So it was actually discovered just over a year ago? No, it was discovered in uh, 1820. By Adams and Leveria are doing mathematical. Uh, yeah, but well, for observed just over a year ago. What do you mean, what was observed over a year ago? Neptune. 1846. It's 165 Earth right. years to a year. Uh -huh. so, First observed in 1846. So it's just by. It's just oh, by. Oh, you said that in a year, sorry. Yeah. I was wondering what you Right, now, uh, it has the fastest <laughs> wind through the solar system up to 1,300 miles per hour. Uh, One so it's got a core of rock and ice, uh, and the mantle of water, ammonia, and methane ices. So it's at 30,760 miles in diameter, so it's four times, nearly four times the size of the Earth. And these are some recent images. And again, it's got a, a ring system and moons. Here's a close up of these of the clouds. Ah, and this is the, the big moon uh, at Neptune Triton. So the, 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 the moons, I don't know, there'd be stuff there that in the moons at Neptune that maybe people might want to visit in the distant future. There's all sorts of these stuff. Are on that one. Yes. These are volcanoes, the black uh -huh. smudges are, are volcanoes. So uh, it's volcanic. Is this the one that's got water geysers erupting? Uh -huh. yeah. It's got gigantic users, yes. And then finally coming to Pluto, which in 1979 when Duncan's book came out, was just a dot. All the pictures that you got in all the books was that they intended to print the discovery pictures from the 30s, uh, and it was just a dot, really. Unless you got one of David Hardy's books when he was doing the artists' impressions of what it might look like. Uh, and that, of course, was last year. And we find that Pluto is a red planet like Mars, which is quite appropriate because it was Percival Long, the guy who more people know about uh, the, the, the canals of Mars, 
and the, all the rest were, oh, uh, he was famous for Mars, but after, when Mars proceeded from the Earth, from that very close opposition in 1879, uh, Percival Lowell then started to look for a new, the ninth planet, or planet X, or whatever it is, you know, he looked, uh, and, and he died before they found it. And it was his assistant, Clyde Tombo, that found it in 1930. Yeah. Um, and you see it, it's just like a planet Mars, and it has this heart shape uh, area here. This is Sputnik, is that, you know, that, that's not a Sputnik planet, it, it, it's the main Tombo planet, or whatever it is after that point. So, it once was, uh, I'll put it in anyway, it was <laughs> in the 70s, as far as I'm concerned, it's not bloody planet, you know. Oh, as I say, you know, the, the most question that I get asked at the observatory is, but a young kid is Pluto or planet. Uh, it, so, it was discovered in 1930, it's the first planet discovered by photography. Uh, because what they were tumbling up or what they were doing was that they were taking plate, the days of real photography, you know, digital nonsense, plate, glass plates with uh, chemicals and and then we developed these plates and uh, I gave a talk about this last year, I don't know how they did it, but they, they did it and then they checked star atlases and they were at it for six months and one day they were given up, they, they did enough of it, we're getting nowhere and they decided they were going to go to the pictures. I don't I can't remember what the film was. And then Clyde said, to hell with it, all one last go. And they didn't go to the pictures, and that was the night they found Pluto. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's quite small, obviously. We, we, it was always a debate about how big Pluto is. Is it the size of the moon? Is it Mars? Or the size of Mercury or something? Uh, it has. So it's 1,473 miles. It's about two thirds that of the Earth's moon. Uh, it has a, one of the surprises that has a temporary atmosphere that seems to be leaking out into space. It occurs when surface ice thaws and evaporates into mostly nitrogen with some methane. Uh, you, so you could jump 10 feet in the Earth on Pluto, that would be 150 feet. So the air pressure is minimal at surface temperatures at minus 375 Fahrenheit, 225 Celsius. Winds when the atmosphere is present. Rock core, Pluto's rocky core is probably surrounded by a mantle of ice with methane and nitrogen frost coating its surface. Uh, and the thing is that uh, originally it was, they were going to send one of the voyagers to Pluto in the 70s. But what happened with the Voyager 2 was that with the pictures of Titan got the scientists quite excited because it this kind of thick atmosphere. Uh, and so they made the decision then that they, they, they would re-target Voyager 1, which was falling on, and that meant that to go to Pluto, uh, they wouldn't be able to do any more. They thought that to go to Titan, uh, they wouldn't be able to go to Pluto. Uh, so that's why that you, you didn't get Uranus and Neptune, Pluto, the, these encounters on that one were lost. And then there was a long gap, uh, and it wasn't until uh, uh, the Bush administration, as George H. Bush, George Bush Sr., that NASA again was looking into uh, a Pluto mission. Uh, and the problem was that they reckoned that if you, you had until about uh, Roughly about this time period, that if you if you left it beyond, I think 2020, uh, you it'd be a waste of time because Pluto was moving so far away in its orbit that the lighting angles with the sun and all the rest of it, uh, so the atmosphere would be gone, and the atmosphere would freeze. That's if there was an atmosphere because we didn't know that the atmosphere would freeze. And the Clinton administration cancelled the space whole lot of these space programs. So that the lobbying in the Bush administration, <laughs> President Bush gave the go ahead to refund this project, and we got a kind of it was a cheaper scaled down version of what we should have had, uh, and 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 it went off, and we were lucky, and we got this for the skin of our teeth. 
And yes, a lot of uh, talk about uh, uh, there's been a lot of interesting talk and uh, proposals of a second Pluto flying by, uh, but they would really need to be doing it now. Uh, and we're looking at 10 year flight plans, again, unless are we going to uh, using a gravitational assist for Jupiter, took about five years off it. Uh, there's some talk about another, not an orbiter, but another flyby that would be timed so we'd see another part of the planet. But whether that will get funded or not remains to be seen. So we know it's got frozen nitrogen, water, ice, and, and a rocky, rocky core. Uh, so it's got a lot of this is areas of water, uh, which is underneath the ground that's been detected. Uh, and this is a beautiful picture, as new horizons and even, and the sunlight shining through that atmosphere, which is leaking out into space. And we started off in 77 when we discovered Charon, uh, a, the moon of uh, Pluto, and we now know that it's got quite a few more, so you get like uh, Hydra, Perivirus, Nets and Sticks. So that is uh, the, the tiny moons of Pluto at the edge of the system. So I hope you all found that interesting and uh, it's just a uh, quick tour. Well, you the the these are excellent uh -huh. pictures you got. I, could, I noticed that space com is it you got. <coughs> yeah, it was all the internet and search, you know, for Very stuff. Good, and, and it was, do I have to write all this information down? Because I'm a slight sick and I haven't remembered the numbers and all the rest of it. So I hunted there, came up, trying to find I found these, that I could use these and the facts on, so I don't need notes. So. I said, again, this isn't really the normal kind of talk that I do. <laughs> <laughs> so you flung me into the deep end, Andy, so yeah. Well done, Robert. Thanks, Robert. Yes, sir, that's quite a nice introduction, yes. Um, Later talks will deal with more detail on each of these bits plus a few more. <laughs> right, yeah. Hopefully, we can uh, get the university really going. Oh, well, you don't need that one, eh? No. We have a cell phone or something on top. So, you, you is, we'd ask to be happy with these new times for the meetings. Can you get people for them? Well, we, 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 we will uh, do the same thing as we did with this one. We'll contact everybody in Galilean and everybody in uh, Astra and everybody in Settlers and see if we can get a few more.